screenplays and um, I don't know Jean-Claude how you work with other directors it's is exactly it, the same as I work with you it's, it's the same so you will be interested how it is um, um, well once we worked on, on the tin drum we had 550 pages novel and the last time Uljan which is on this afternoon, uh, Jean-Claude called me and I had three pages. Um, but the four, work... I need four. Four. <laughs> well, anyhow, there was, on the last page and the last line, was an image, um, uh, which is... Um, I'm not going to tell the story of the movie, but uh, it is the woman followed a man all the way across Kazakhstan to this holy mountain Kantengri where he wants to stay and to die, I suppose. Uh, and uh, she parts, she says, okay, if this is what you want to do, that's what you do. She leaves, now she has two horses, her own horse and the horse uh, this man has. And when she reaches a certain point in the mountain, she has second thoughts, she gets off her horse, she ties the horse to a tree or a rock there, and then without looking back, leaves. And the last image is this horse standing there, alone, alone waiting, as he put in the screenplay, for the man whom she knows to come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so basically the film started from this image. A horse is there standing in the mountain, alone. waiting alone, and now you go backwards. How could we start the movie? <laughs> you know, where, how did the horse get there? Because this is a powerful image. Everybody, you know, immediately thinks of whatever Western or uh, mythology or La Chanson de Roland or whatever, um, it's, it's a strong image. Um, and then, okay, we developed from there. So when, when we were asking how do we work together, uh, I mean, the way we did it is usually meet in the morning at nine and from nine to one, which is about the maximum, let's rather say 12.30, three and a half hours is as long as the brain can work in one row. At least our brains. Our brains. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we talk about a specific scene. Okay, here, here is the scene where the parents, Oscar comes in with the drum, and his parents want to take the drum away and he starts screaming and the glass breaks uh, of uh, the clock. The clock's glass in the room breaks and he discovers he has this power. So there again we sit and we say, okay, we know the last shot will be the glass breaking. No, we need a reaction shot. After the glass breaking, we have to show the reaction of the parents who stare at Oscar. Oh, then we need a reaction show of Oscar close up because now he understands because his parents stare at him and then he looks back at the clock that we cut again at the clock. So now he understands that he has supranational power and therefore that he is somebody special. 
Okay, so we make a little note. Last shot, Oscar wandering, the clock, the parents, the glass breaking, the screaming. Now let's see, where do we start the scene? This is the type of conversation I remember very well. I don't. Shall we start? Um, well, I've seen it a few more times. <laughs> Shall we start um, as Oscar comes in from the street, beating his drum and getting on everybody's nerve? Uh, it's kind of easy, too easy. Maybe we should start the parents inside the shop and they don't really get along too well because the third person is there, the cousin, the, the second probable father. So there is a tension between these three adults and now comes in the boy with the drum and, and we understand he is disturbing. Yeah, but it, wouldn't it be better that we cut right into the middle of the scene without any introduction, just start a close-up of his father saying, Oscar, give me the drum, stop knocking. We don't, maybe we don't need all this introduction. So this, this is screenwriting. <laughs> to decide, do we start with Oscar crossing the street drumming? Do we start with a quarrel between his two fathers and his mother and he is interrupting? Or do we cut straight into a close-up of his father? The scene before was maybe that Oscar had to drink a horrible soup uh, with frogs and this and that the children infused him. So once we have a feeling, okay, we got two possible beginnings or we got three possible beginnings. So we keep these three possible beginnings and uh, that is basically, I mean, I've been very fast now, uh, this is basically already an, an hour's work. And, and he screen takes writing notes. Is, screenwriting is already filmmaking. It's to you see, it's total Absolutely. filmmaking. When we you talk write about it, well, if he comes in, does he come in in a close-up or is it a wide shot? You, you know, practically the, the film yeah. is being made mm. and then notes are being taken, very minimal. And in the afternoon, it's not at all that we take a nap. In the afternoon, Jean-Claude writes down what we discussed in the morning, how the scene breaks down. And then next morning, you know, I start by reading this and I said, oh, but I thought we said that we, uh, we don't uh, show as he enters the shop. This. And he said, yes, but as I wrote it down, I had the feeling it was better to start with him entering the shop. And, uh, and so we, uh, now we get to the dialogue. Now, what, is the parent, what, what are the parents going to say? Uh, should he say this line? And then Jean-Claude says, no. Maybe, maybe he should say, oh, you know what would be nice, you know, he could talk about that the, that the, the how do you call it, the rouleau, the, the, the curtain, the iron curtain in front of the shop needs fixing, it doesn't come down anymore. There has to be something practical his father is concerned with. Uh, so how, how could he say that? Now this takes, okay, uh, we do this in French and uh, and the next, uh, once I have his pages, in the Tin Drum, for instance, I, I translate into German and uh, look how did Günter Grass write, which words did he use for the dialogue at this place. And I try to translate Jean Claude's dialogue into German using Günter Grass' words. And I find that it's, a, it's much simplified in the way Jean-Claude wrote it, as compared to the literary language of Gunter Grass. And I'm very happy because I'm getting rid of literature and getting closer to cinema. And uh, when I write something that, uh, as he said, well, finally, uh, writing the scene, uh, I think it would be better to put that line than when he shoots. He cuts off the line <laughs> and he says, we, when I shot, I think it'd be better without the line. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so. 
that happens. That happens yeah. all the time. Or, or I call him in the middle of the night yeah. from the end of the world and say, Jean-Claude, we need two lines when they meet there. <laughs> Desperately. <laughs> Desperately, you know. When, 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 when must never forget when we write a script that a script has no existence. It's an object which is going to disappear, to vanish away and to become a film. So it's, it's a transitory state, condition of a film. You know, it's, it's not a book. It's not something which is going to be published or read. A, a, a script is going to be read by 50, 60 persons, no more. And then it will usually at the end of a shooting we find a script in the garbage can of the studio, <laughs> you know. The script doesn't exist anymore. So that we, we have always to think about that reality, that a script is a, the first version of a film, but without the technical means to make a film, without yeah. a camera, without it. So when the director is going to shoot and then to edit the, the film, Many details and phrases and moments that we thought were necessary in the script are not necessary anymore. Well, th this is, is why, for instance, um, I'm not so much in the favor of that the editor in the cutting room, who is receiving every day the dailies, the material we shot, I'm not so much in a favor to give him the screenplay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he should read the screenplay before uh, we start before shooting. Or shooting yeah. But a good editor, he keeps the screenplay, you know, on a, uh, in a closet or somewhere on the shelf and does not look at it anymore while he is editing the film. He is in the next step, he's just receiving this raw material, all the dailies, and he's trying to say, how can you make a scene out of this? You know, what would be nice to cut from here to there? So whatever we thought in the screenplay for him is of no interest because now he has to find what does the material tell him? Mm -hmm. where, where does he feel, oh, this would be a great shot to start the scene with. So our whole thinking about whether we should start with Oscar crossing the street or the parents quarreling or his father, you know, being angry because the curtain doesn't function, for him is irrelevant because all of a sudden he sees a shot before the glass breaks in the clock and we just see the tick duck tick duck he says, this is the picture we will start the scene with. But that depends very much on the director's work care. Because when I was working with Benuel, Benuel was doing the editing before the shooting. Uh -huh. When he shot, the film was already edited in his head. Yes. You know, so that it was very precisely done. He would, he would make the editing of a whole film in two days. Mm -hmm. Just cutting before, you know, just adapting. Now, there, there was other directors like Miloš Forman, edit, when they edit the film, they remake it. Yeah. You know, they have a lot of, of, of different possibilities, different angles, and now they are making, they are trying to find the best possibility. Well, I, I don't try to have too many angles, no. uh, uh, because it's exhausting for everybody, <laughs> yeah. for the actors, and it's very costly. Uh, I try to have the editing, as you say, with Bunuel, but experience told me that often the editor, when he looks at the material, comes up with the same material, which was meant to be edited in some way, yeah. to edit in a slightly different way. Um, anyhow, uh, I wanted to come back to the screenplay a minute, because this is another uh, very specific quality of Jean-Claude, and every other screenplay writer I work with, I always tell him that he of Jean-Claude and every other screenplay writer I work with, I always tell him, this is no good what you do here. He says, why? Well, he starts the scene and there he writes, um, uh, it's a shop in a little screen, uh, street. Uh, the, 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 the curtain is, is yellow, the entrance door is quite narrow. In the living room there is a large table, on the wall there is a painting of this and that, uh, there is a big clock uh, in the background. Uh, uh, 
she, uh, his mother is wearing her red dress, the father has a two-piece suit. Already 20 lines. What is this? Who, who is, who is, are we making a documentary? Are we what? going to the room? No, Jean-Claude uh, writes only what you see when, when you actually see the film. You, you should yeah. read the screenplay only like Oscar Andres with his John. Now, the father turns around. He is standing next to a clock, maybe. So we know maybe behind him there is the clock. Huh? That, and next line, the mother turns around. Uh, that she's wearing a red dress is irrelevant for the screenplay. The costume lady will know that. Uh, so his, his screenplay reads really like you see a film. And you don't have first a description of a location, and then comes the dialogue. That's a theater play. That's not a screenplay. Nineteenth screen century. Nineteenth yeah. century is there. Yeah, good point. Yes, that's what I'm, I'm trying to do uh, all the time. I mean, and also to characterize the characters through what they do and say, exactly. and not to have a precise idea of the characters before they enter, like before yeah. they appear. That's a Chekhov phrase, you know, very famous, yes. uh, which I, I um, always keep in my mind. I mean, don't try to give a definition of the characters theoretically. Yeah. Put them into the action and, and see what they do. You know? Yes, so, and, and, and you can only discover the character step by step. Step by step, of course. You, you cannot exactly write, you know, a characteristic. Now, this character is a very angry man and, and blah, 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 blah. And you go because he had a bad childhood and whatnot. You that know, was he's nice. unhappy in his marriage and so on. No, bullshit. You just show in this situation, does he smile or is he slapping his son? Yeah. If he's slapping his son, oh, this guy must have a problem. Mm. That's all we know. What's the problem? Ah, okay. Mystery, suspense. We will find out in scene five. Mm. <laughs> but like, don't make it obvious and especially never say in the dialogue what, uh, what people would not say in real life. I mean, don't put in the dialogue information you want to give to the audience. You know, he would not say, look, it's 25 years now we are working together. No, <laughs> no. If I say that, it is only to tell you that we're working together 25 years. He knows damn well, you know, or look, it, it's been now 37 years we've been married or so. You hear that in movies all the time. We know. And in, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that is not the type of information that should be in the dialogue. Uh, this is analytical dialogue, no good. And in even less the deeper meaning. No, di no information in the dialogue and especially no deeper meaning. <laughs> I mean, what, uh, it's, it's like the character should not spell out who he is and what he, why he does this and that. And the movie should not spell out uh, in the dialogue what the message is. It should come in between if, the lines. If, if there is one. If there is one. Uh, Most of the time there is no, nothing to deliver. I mean, just a story to tell, a situation to, to develop and present. And if there is a meaning or a message, it's not to us to say. I mean, it's uh, everybody, you know, including the spectators. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering uh, another thing, Jean-Claude, which is about this meaning, is when we started the tin drum, we literally didn't have a structure. It is like, and then, and then, and then, and then. I mean, before you got involved. And I said, this, this will be like, you know, just pearls on a string. One fantastic moment in Oscar's life after the other. And then you said, no, no, no. No, 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 there is a curb in it. I say, where is the curb? He is you know, he's always the same. He doesn't grow up. He is uh, three years old in the beginning and he's still the same character at the end, even though he says he's 21 now. And he says, no, the, the curb is the rise, 
the coming of the Nazis to power, their rise, their the high point, and then sure. the beginning of the ending of the Nazis and the end of the war and at the end the fall. And this is exactly the, the time frame of the film, but this is exactly the, the, the curve of the history behind Oscar's own story we're telling. And I had not been aware of it, and I don't think Gunder Grass had been aware of it, because his novel starts much earlier and goes much further. But this was the, the frame uh, uh, we choose for that's the what, screen. That's why we decided to stop the film to end in 1945, in 1945 yeah. at yeah. the end of the Second World War. That was you know, a, a date which for everybody meant something. And it was the end of the personal Oscar development. Yes, absolutely. You have to make uh, you know things going in parallel ways. The, 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 the action, the characters, and the environment, the historical environment all around. Yeah. Absolutely, that's uh, essential. And, and talking about uh, Ulsan, at the beginning I didn't know exactly where I was going to. You know, and and and, and uh, also I learned the more I, I work, to hide the script. Mm -hmm. Not only the intentions of the script, but the building up of the script, the articulations of the script, yeah. not to make them obvious, mm -hmm. apparent, you know. So in, in, in Ulshan, there is a story. I mean, everybody sees, every, every scene brings something new to the character. And little by little we discover where he goes, why, what happened to him in the past. But the secret of the film, to me, I There discovered, seems to be no story. <laughs> yes, yeah, since I discovered much later, uh, the, 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 you know, the, that there is inside this man a secret desire not to die, but to live. To live. To live, which he doesn't know. Just, just doesn't to explain, to this yeah. is the story of a man who says he wants to die, and he thinks he wants to die. But and the whole purpose of his trip is to go to his death. Because she is sure. And talking, uh, just to make it a joke, why does she leave such a beautiful host, you know, lost in the mountains? She is in the story the daughter of a horse's merchant. So she knows the value of a horse. She wouldn't leave a horse alone in the mountains, you know, without being sure that the man is going to come. Especially, it's her favorite horse, it's her, favorite. <laughs> her own favorite horse. Uh, another thing about the, the screenplay uh, of uh, Jean-Claude and the working with him, uh, as we said, you know, in the screenplay should only be seen what, what you can, uh, should be written what you can actually see, yeah. you know. I mean, you, you cannot uh, explain or shoot things that are, uh, you know, meanings, you, you need facts. But what Jean-Claude does, he does drawings all the time. He takes notes, of course, of what we say, but while he takes notes, all of a sudden he comes up with a cartoon. It's not a storyboard, it's just one kind of one situation that sums up the scene, uh, which is uh, almost like uh, uh, it helps a, lot. A, a caricature, but it helps, it helps enormously. I show these to to the actors later or to the cinematographer to say, look, this is what, what this scene is about. <laughs> uh, uh, did you always have this visual uh, yeah, you know, I we, never know how that well, came I, to I, you. I, I start my first work was of a cartoonist. You know, the first money I made oh. in my life was my drawing. So I kept drawing, but uh, not professionally, of course, if, if you want to be a a real drawer, you have to draw three, four hours a day, which I have yeah. no time to do. But on another, on another, working with Benoit, for instance, you work together closely, like we did, or with other people, facing each other. But when we face each other, your right is my left. Yes. And your left is my right side, okay? So when we talk about left, and right in the screenplay, yeah. we see different direction. <laughs> so the, the the fact of drawing is a way to correct and to put you and me agree on yeah. the space, the third, 
right. dimension that we have to, to, to reach, which is the dimension, the space of yeah, the yeah. film, not your space, not yeah. my space, but the space yeah. of the film. I remember, you know, working with Benoit, for instance. We work one day on one scene, let's say the disco charm of the bourgeoisie. Then the full, I make the, at night I, I make two or three drawings. The following day, without showing him the drawings, I said to him, Louis, in the scene of the paratroopers, on which side of the screen is the, the entrance door? He says, on the left side. If in the drawing it is on the left side, it means we are in the same space. You understand? <laughs> If it's on yes. the right, we have to work again. Yeah. That, that's a, a way to check, you know, to, to, to verify that, that we are really in, not only in the same story, in the same mood, but also already in the same image of the film. Now, that's, we, that, that's we're, priceless. We, we, are, we are talking here about Kingdom is 30 years ago, uh, your work with Bunuel is partly even longer, 40 years ago. And, and more recent. Uh, do you have a, a feeling since you started working that screenplay writing did change? Yes, it did change. It did. I mean, when the, when uh, the first scripts I had in my hands, when I was 22, 23, were classical French scripts from the 50s, by Crusoe, by... Mm -hmm. They were very well, or everything was there. You know, you know the, everything was technical, not, not only the camera, make good camera frame work, work, uh, everything. The it was on tracking. The script was a technical object mm -hmm. which was unreadable. Yeah. You know, nobody except the technicians could read it. And then the new wave came. And the new wave was, for many reasons, was to shoot outside, you know, in real locations, which means that you can't conform the decoration to what you have written, which was the case before. Everything was shot in Because the, the door you yeah. were saw on the left side, yeah, the absolutely. real location, and then, maybe it was on the right side. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then you have to adapt, of course, the right. And the more we, the, we, we, I went, and I felt, you know, working with in many different countries and, and languages, now the scripts are less and less explained. Than, than, than there were before. Like the Ulshan, for instance, a lot is left to the spectators to, to, to enter mm -hmm. the film, to put from their own feelings and emotions and, and sentiments into the, what we propose. That, you, you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, do you, do you think and this I'm is because sure. the audience is reacting faster, because they are immersed day and night in know. pictures, images, wherever they go on television and you know, in movies? You know, when I told me that at the very beginning of, of the cinema, when, when he was seven, eight years old, in Zaragoza, in Spain, in 1907, when I used to go to see the first movies, next to the screen, there was a man with a bamboo stick, you know, explaining, because the, the language was so new that nobody could not. Now, the man goes to the window and looks onto the street and sees his wife with somebody else. No, just because the language was so new. So, now we, the cinema is more than 100 years old, and the audience got used to this language. There are many, many things that, that we see in the film even from the 30s and 40s, you know. For instance, I tell you, let's meet tomorrow in my office, which is uh, uh, 45 Madison Avenue at 4 o'clock. In the 20s and 30s, the next shot is Madison Avenue, yeah. yes. A clock saying, the, you know, 10 to 4 o'clock, you see, and the man walking in the street, entering the building number uh, to so and so, and all of these disappear. Now we go directly, not only we go directly into the office, but we go directly to the warmest moment of the scene. Exactly. You, you understand what I mean? So that's, a, that's the evolution, the natural evolution of the language of cinema all along the century. And of course, if you write today a script like uh, people used to write them in the 50s, you are, you are lost, you lose the audience. Well, it's yes, not yes. only in screenwriting, it is also in the shooting. I mean, the way uh, we used to learn is if somebody 
exit the screen on the right side, in the next shot he has yes, to enter yes, from, the from the left side. Left side. And, uh, a rule. and and if you see that he's entering the door to your yeah. office, you know yeah. you see him first opening the door from the outside, and then you have to cut to a reverse shot where you see him come in from the inside. Uh, in today's editing, and I think it all came from from Abu Zufl from Godard. The famous uh, scene in the in the, in the in the room. In the room, you you don't uh, pretend that there is a continuity. You know, the continuity matching was, was the great thing. And it's, whether it's in screenwriting or in shooting, comes, comes we just this. go from one privileged moment to the next interesting moment. And the fact that the first moment was in the kitchen and the second one is in the bathroom, we don't know, need to show how he's going from the kitchen into the bathroom. No, we simply cut in the middle of the line uh, or he looks at and cut and the answer comes in the bathroom. And we all know, oh, so now he is in the bathroom. So anyhow, how d does it really, uh, th that's in the making, does it really affect uh, the screenwriting or is it, yeah. is it still that, that no, no, you no, have no, to no, find no, a no, curb no, for each scene? By, by doing what you say, when you cut to a certain moment of a certain scene, you look for the best possible thing to show, and you want to surprise the audience. You know, to, to do something unexpected, just to to maintain the attention. Mm. What you talk about the continuity of a scene that comes from the theater, from the tradition of the theater. In a theater, in any classical play, the scene last exactly the same time that what we show, what we see, exactly the same time. And for a long time it was the same, the same in a scene, in a film. Some exceptions are in Shakespeare, which was a, a genius. You can have, for instance, in Shakespeare, in some plays, one character enters, he speaks to other characters, some, somebody else uh, enters, goes out, and so the same character stays on stage, you know, for let's say 10 minutes, and when he goes out, we are five years later. <laughs> that's very clever, you know, and but that, that only a genius could do that, you know. That's what we try slowly to do in film, in films writing. It's very, very difficult to get rid of this parallelism between a real action in a real life and, like Godard did in Amour de Souffle, to cut inside a scene, moment, just privileged moments, and just to show them. But the more the cinema goes, the more it goes in that direction, no doubt about it. But, but still, when uh, you, I, we uh, start a work on a screenplay, uh, there is still the necessity of some dramatic structure. Yeah. Uh, you are always the one who says, what we need is somebody who wants something, and then there are obstacles yeah, yeah. or others That's who stage. don't that want remains. him to get that. That remains. And at the end, either he gets it or he doesn't. But yeah. basically, without that, there is no film, there is no story, right? Yes, as Budmer used to put it, you can, you can do anything except anything. On peut faire n'importe quoi sur n'importe quoi. And what else? Shall we write a script now? Now we <laughs> write a screenplay about how to do a, a lecture without a screenplay. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, it reminds me all the time, let's imagine that we are in a painting school. We are two painters, and we explain to you how to paint. But without any color, without any pen, without knowing. So, if you want to, go to do a good painting, first of all, you have to do this, this, and this is absurd, of course. You know, the, the best way is to organize workshops, to work together. I mean, to, if you want to be a, a, a screenwriter, if anybody wants to be a screenwriter, he has to know, to learn about the movie language. That's the language he's going to use all his or her life long. No, no, no doubt about it. So you have to 
work with the, with the technicians to be on the set to, to watch how a film is done. I mean, it's not a, being a screenwriter is not living alone in a room and working like a novelist at all. That, that's nothing to do. The, the writing a script is not the end of a literary adventure. It's the beginning of a filmmaking adventure. You know, a, a screenwriter is part of the team. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, in, ever, ever since I was in America, I'm rehearsing a lot with the actors, uh, sometimes weeks, or if possible, weeks before the shooting, so that it would sink in with them, and literally on a bare stage or in a room, you know, just a mark, let's say there's a chair, a table. Oh, we did it for the tin drum too. Uh, and, um, and at this point, it is very important that the screenwriter comes, he doesn't need to stay the whole time, but he just comes in and has a look for 10 minutes. Uh, he can see what the stuff he is writing, the dialogues, whether it works or not. He can see what the director and the actors do wrong and he says, no, 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 but this is the wrong tone for the scene shouldn't be done this way, you, you take it far too seriously, you know. Uh, it, it should be like a very light conversation, don't make a drama of it, or, or this kind of a reaction. Uh, also, uh, sometimes we, we find out during rehearsals that uh, a scene maybe should go in a different way, or one should, you know, reposition a little line of dialogue. Uh, even uh, Arthur Miller, after you know, Death of a Salesman has been created in 1947 on stage, has been played thousands and hundreds of thousands of times around the world. When we were actually shooting it, uh, there was one scene I said, you know, she picks up the, the, the it's between the first and the second act, uh, the mother, the sons leave, the father leaves, and mother stays alone at home and she tidies up and all of a sudden she picks up the telephone and she starts to talk for a whole page which on film is like endless it seems like 10 minutes uh, because she's calling she gets a call from one of her sons and she explains him something and i say but Arthur, we know all that why is this scene there and she Look, it's always been done like that, you know, don't fix it if it ain't broke, uh, this is a good play. The next morning he comes uh, again uh, as we rehearse for the shooting and he says, you know, I thought about it last night. Uh, when we were doing the first production on Broadway, the, the building of the sets, the change of the set between the second and the first act took so long, and, but I didn't want to have an intermission. I wanted the audience to stay in the house so that the play would be received as, as one thing. So after I had finished writing the play, I added this phone call at the time, and it's always been done. And it lasts exactly the time they need to change the set. I say, yeah, but we don't need this time because we cut <laughs> from one scene to the next. And uh, even though it had been a deal that we would not cut a single line of dialogue, we cut that whole monologue. <laughs> because it, it, it didn't belong there. Whereas in another scene, uh, for, for, for the kind of the purpose of, of the film to have a nice entering into the scene, it, we, we added some, some, some dialogue. So it is, uh, as you say, a screenplay is, is not meant to stay. It is not a work in itself. It's, it's a stage on the way. It's a blueprint, like for a building. You know, once the building is there, hopefully it will hold on its own and, and the, the blueprint has done its purpose. Yeah. I tell you worse. Yes. When we did with, with Peter Brook, uh, we did once a theater adaptation in French of 
Chekhov, the Cherry Orchard, a very famous play, remember? And I did the French text closely, very closely, working with a Russian person, you know, to very, you know, as well as I could. And the play was a great success. Then we decided to shoot the play, because it was for the French television, I don't remember. So Peter prepared everything, put what we call the fourth wall, you know, to the, but it was exactly the, the, the play. And then we start shooting, and we realized that the rhythm, not only of the words, but the rhythm of the feelings, is not at all the same when you see it with your own eyes and when you see it on a screen. And little by little, don't repeat to anybody, yeah. we cut 25 minutes from, from Chekhov, and nobody noticed it. No, not, not even a specialist of Chekhov noticed that the, the film was 25 minutes shorter than the play. Yeah. That, that's a, it's a different language, it's a different, you know, what I had with Marx, I, I had with Max Frisch uh, uh, a debate once, you know, talking about film and literature, and uh, and I, my my conviction was always well, literature is, you know, uh, you can do so much more with literature than you can do with film. Somehow it seems to be the more noble art and more refined and everything. And he you, said, you, he you, said, I don't know what you're talking about. Usually, usually you don't say that. You say that because you, you, you are talking to an audience, but when we are together, you don't speak <laughs> like this to me. <laughs> well, I, that was because I was talking to a great writer. It's not even because I was talking to an audience. But anyhow, uh, we, we were kind of debating advantages and, you know, possibilities of film as against possibilities of literature. We were talking about that during the screening actually last night, like flashbacks you cannot do in films anymore. It's dead, it's over. Yeah, it, it, it's very it's, you can only do it in literature. But, uh, okay, I close the parenthesis. So anyhow, Max Frisch told me, this is completely stupid what you're telling me. You know, film has so much more possibilities than television. Look the close-up here of, of this young actress, you know, 19 years old, uh, the, uh, the, the daughter in love with her father. In this one close-up, in 10 seconds, the audience receives and feels so much, it would take me 15 pages to convey that to a reader. Not even to convey, I mean, to... And also, when very, very few people realize that the cinema, compared to theater, has invented the possibility to whisper, to speak like this, in a very low voice, which was totally impossible on stage. You know, in century, you understand that that's a new way. Not only, not 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 only this, but he had also invented silence, as as you said, the fact that I look at you in a certain way. A question that raises all the time when we write a script is the question: Is it possible to act this? We have three means: image, sound, and acting of the actors. With these three elements combined, is it possible to act this or do we need words to explain? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really the moment when you introduce the words, it means that you have no means to express exactly what you want to express. That, that, and est -ce que ça se joue? Yeah. Yeah. Is it possible to play, to act this, you know, for an actor? technicians and the director, is it possible to give this without explaining what we want to say? That's, that's the, the question that raises at every moment of everything. And sometimes we fail, of course, sometimes we cannot. Any questions from the floor? Any answer? <laughs> <laughs> 
ale ja bardzo proszę na bardzo cenną żonę. Z tych swoich synów w Kazachstanu, co było w dyskusji z Komisji Europejskiej, która mówi w such a far away place, and what was your experience working there? No, I And the second question is particularly to Dr. Kavir. Did you think that the strange of a little bit of our faith in a fiction introducing three characters speaking French in Kazakhstan? Yeah. Maybe so, I answered the second question yeah. which was put to him, but he should answer the question why in Kazakhstan? Because this whole thing started with me you know, getting a phone call from Jean-Claude who asked me, do you want to make a film in Kazakhstan? <laughs> and I said, yes, where is it? <laughs> I had never been to Kazakhstan and once I was invited to the, uh, the festival for Almaty to the Film Festival of Almaty and uh, by a producer who asked me would it be possible to, to set a story in this extraordinary country which is a very vast, huge country with very few inhabitants, 15 million of inhabitants for a country which is five times the size of France. So I said, we, but all the possibility would be to have a Frenchman coming to Kazakhstan and trying to do something in Kazakhstan. That's the reason why the man speaks French, because he is French. And also the second man that he means, it's also the French attaché of the two men. The problem of the girl was a bit different, because she had to speak a little French, you know. She speaks very little in the, very, in the film. But that's the reason why we made her a, a French teacher in Kazakhstan, which does exist. I have seen some of them. And also, it was to, to me and to Volker funny, interesting, surprising to arrive in a very remote place in Kazakhstan and to hear French songs, you know, French songs from children. And she's teaching how to song, to sing. You know, that I like very much. That's what. In the rest of the film, she speaks very, very, very little. As you know, but uh, you know, it's a very philosophical question you are asking, because uh, you ask the question because the people speak French. Now, if you go to see Schindler's List, aren't you surprised that all these Germans speak English? <laughs> <laughs> no, you are not. No, we, are, we in fact, as an audience, we accept whether it's an American movie or whether it's some type of so-called European international production, that everybody is speaking English. Mm. And it, it's, it's a convention. It's like uh, Shakespeare's Othello speaks English while the action is set in, in Venice. How come? You know, uh, strange. And Hamlet doesn't speak Danish. I, I have a nice, uh, <laughs> nice story. Uh, but nice story. that is, I mean, the, but the convention today in filmmaking, and we all suffer from it, and I'm sure Bulgarian filmmakers will suffer from it in the okay. future, because everybody urges us, but you got to shoot in English. You got to shoot in English. It, be it becomes kind of the universal language of filmmaking. And if, if Uljan, uh, these three characters spoke English, nobody would worry. The fact that they speak French, and, and, and we didn't even find an American distributor, you know. They, they would buy a French movie where the people speak French, uh, but they said, but this, this is, this, they said, this is said it's more too complex. weird that they speak French. <laughs> but once to, t to tell you one thing, I, I was in Spain and with two uh, Spanish uh, friends. And they were talking about Milos Forman Amadeus. And one was defending the fact that the film was in, in, in English and the other one was attacking. And the other one was saying, but why is Amadeus, you know, shot in English? It's absurd. And the other one, in Spanish, was saying, would you prefer the film to be in German? <laughs> and he didn't know what to answer. <laughs> Being Spanish. You know? It was very funny because it was, they were talking in Spanish. No, but I want to come back about now Kazakhstan, the, 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 the first question, decide what, what mm -hmm. I, I really literally didn't know where it was. He said, it's Central Asia, 
But anyhow, we are not deal this is not a geopolitical film. We are, we're not dealing with this entity. It is, we, we need the, most, the emptiest space and the most unknown space possible uh, uh, to tell this story, which is a very archaic story. It, it's the story of a man who has such a grief that he would like to vanish from the face of the earth. So of course you could either go into Manhattan and get lost among five million people. No, but he wanted to really go into the desert, in, in, into a, a country without cities, without villages, uh, some this this type of an archaic place. And this is what I was tempted. I mean, this this is like uh, the, the 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 frontier movie. He goes beyond the frontier, like the Western hero went into a territory which was beyond the frontier, where it was open, where it is is to be discovered, where he can get lost. And 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 when when I traveled in the country, we, we had this problem. We could literally not get from one place to the other, which was sometimes two thousand kilometers, because there was no road, no trains, no 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 air connection. Uh, so this still does exist, and that makes it plausible that a man would just walk, you know, just go go through the step, and this is uh, kind of what we needed. It is it, it's uh, it's Central Asia, but it is kind of an inner space. It's uh, yeah, it is space as such. <laughs> so I, I tell you, which was to me the key phrase to write the film. I was in Almaty one day, in my first trip there, and somebody said to me, tonight, let's go to have a dinner in the old city. And I said, when was built the old city? And the answer was, by the time of Brezhnev. It means it's a country without past, without archaeological, archaeological research, you know, research without villages, without, it's a totally new country. So, the fact that the winds of a cold coast in Kazakhstan, which are already destroyed, of course, and the winds of Babylon are the same. All the winds are the same. That's something which really struck me a lot. You know, I, 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 for the first time in my life, I realized that the whole past is past. You understand what I mean? That the, was well, the whether it's 20 years ago or, or, or 20,000 20, years 000. ago, there's no difference. There's no difference. And, and that's really, I really, it struck me a lot. I thought a lot about this, you know. And that's part of, that's what decided me to write the, the, the film. Brezhnev finally is responsible <laughs> for that film, you know. <laughs> well, we saw his death last night. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe we could. Stop. Okay, maybe we go and see a movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for all.